Well, that was all very entertaining. Well, mostly very yeah. entertaining. Very Arsenal entertaining. did get the goal in the end. It wasn't the greatest of Sundays of Premier League football, but the rest of the weekend was amazing. And there's still another game to come. Marion Melchiot and Darren Lewis are here with us to look ahead uh, to next weekend a little bit later on, but also to look back at what's been happening this weekend. And it has been incredible. All that late drama. It yes. feels like now we, we've got a little bit of extra added time. It's not masses, but it is. A, but it feels like every time the board goes up, you think there's going to be goals in this? I quite, there's something about it. I quite like it. People are, you know, there's enough time for you to to go for it. And say, let's let's go for it. You know, you look at Tottenham's result for us. They they went for it. You yeah. know, what I mean, in the end, they 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 got. It's so important to try and get the three points. And if you get the time, you just got to go for it. I I like the extra time. Absolutely. I love the extra yeah. time. It because you feel it in the crowds. You can yeah. hear it when the board goes up. And if it's a team's minutes. behind, yeah. you, there's yeah. a it feels roar. good. It feels that, good. Yeah. Yeah. I like it when it's not my team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, it, yeah. if I'm watching, yeah, I like yeah. it. But when I'm playing, no, don't put an extra time it, it, on. Yeah, it does, because first. a minute feels like an hour oh, when you're playing, especially absolutely. if you're winning. Yeah. I remember the first time in, in Qatar when they did it and the guy held up a gate at the, the board and it was like... 14 minutes and it was a gasp <laughs> across. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 14 minutes, what's going on? But it was brilliant. I love it, yeah, I have to admit. I do like I absolutely it. love it. I think what always fascinates me um, is that players waste time knowing that they're going to hold the board up yeah. and it's going to be 10 minutes at the end. And then they're shocked when they hold the board up and it's 10 minutes at the end. I can yes. never believe it. I can never understand yeah. it. Yeah, I think I saw something with Arsenal. I think there were some players that went down, I think, after they scored. And I think Mikel, I think I saw Mikel telling them to get up. Mm. Yeah. I think I saw him say to, to, to get up and just get on with it. I saw that because we're seeing now players are using that. OK, let me go down and, and take the sting out. And you know what I mean? I saw him tell them to get up, which was quite interesting as well. Yeah, but even then at the end of that game, the Everton fans were all complaining because there wasn't enough time yeah. added on <laughs> at the end. And then Sean Dyche was saying, and then there was 45 seconds yeah. from someone, well, there was an injury. Only 10 and minutes, what yeah. about, should be 25. Yeah, it was, yeah so it, it's starting to get that, that managers are looking for extra time if they need a goal. But I just wonder, when you look at the, the late goals that, that happened this weekend, I just wonder if it is going to benefit the teams with bigger squads, the, the bigger teams, mm. if you like, because we saw Wolves go ahead again to Liverpool yeah. and then this one from Andy Robertson mm. put Liverpool in front and then obviously there's the, the goal from, from Harvey Elliott that, mm -hmm. that turns up, that is deflected off, off mm -hmm. Bueno, but, it, and, and Liverpool ended up getting that 3-1 three, three win. Mm -hmm. But that, those goals were 85 and then into the 90-plus minute. Erling Haaland, I know it wasn't a late turnaround for them, but he wanted to get on the, on the score sheet. And then Aston Villa yes. with that huge yeah. turnaround. And obviously, they ended up playing right till you know, 12 minutes plus yeah. of, of extra time because of the, the decision making in terms of, of giving them that penalty. So they managed to, to turn it around. And then Spurs. this yeah. from Spurs, Kuliszewski, that's the latest ever winning goal in the Premier League. With Richarlison. No, uh, the Kuliszewski goal coming this up one. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the this latest is, ever? Yeah, latest oh. ever winner. Wow, in, look in at the, the crowd. Look. Oh. But, but interestingly, oh. that's, an, that's another one where the equaliser went in from Richarlison. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about what that can kind of mean to, to his Spurs career. But the minute that went in, even following it on social media, yeah. and you could definitely feel it through the, the screen in the crowd, the fans were thinking, we can go and win this. Yeah, mm -hmm. And they were already well into yeah. to add a time. Yeah, in the you game. can see with Bishalis in the way he got the ball out and went and then they come back. What I was quite pleased to see there is our the rapturous applause and the, the celebration at Spurs because what happens with, with Arsenal, because we've had one of those already this season, you know, where you score a late one, it's it's what it's about Absolutely. at the latter stages of a game and you snatch it, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like fans, <laughs> fans should be enjoying it like that. You know, yeah. people say they're saying, oh, the celebration police come out and say, oh, what are they celebrating like? It's only five yeah. games. It's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's why you play football. Mm. I, I think there have been a lot of dramatic finishes. I know Liverpool's didn't go into added time, but the epic finish uh, at the end of the Newcastle mm. game was a, a good example of the explosion of joy that yeah. you're referring to, which uh. is why we fall in love with the game in the first place. Yeah. The referees, I just, I think it's a vindication of the policy from the referees of saying, if you waste time, we will add it on at mm -hmm. the end. A lot of people say, oh my goodness, what's this going to do for, for player welfare? Mm -hmm. And you're not taking us seriously. It's very simple. Don't waste time. Yeah. Simple. Wes Fodderingham for Sheffield United went down twice in his game against Spurs, right? You saw that goal, mm. uh -huh. goal scored by Kulisevsky. Both times, the other goalkeeper was stripped and ready to come on. Right. Both times, Wes Fodderingham made a miraculous recovery mm. and he was back up yep. and he was mm. able to play. 
And to us as an observer, it's my job to observe football. Mm. It looked like an attempt to waste, waste time. He yeah. might say yeah. otherwise, so I, I have to be fair to him. But from my eyes, it looked like an attempt to just run the clock down. Yeah, the goal but now still, yeah. we're going to use tricks, right? I mean, like, even when we watch the game now, like back in the day, we would go, go in the corner, right, and do something and whatever. But nowadays, I remember, like, <laughs> my time, I have once, they said, you have to be... Tent in the league. Imagine tent in the league. People will go like, oh, that's silly. Why mm -hmm. tent? You got to win it. But that moment, it was like the team was going to get a bonus. It was a yeah. winger. <laughs> so we were like, Premier League, tent in the league. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. <laughs> Run to the corner. But there were a couple of moments where we were playing a game and one of the guys tried to dribble. We said, why are you dribbling? <laughs> why are you dribbling? Yeah. They go, we got two minutes. Why are you dribbling? Just kick the ball in the corner. And we said, that's not football, man. You cannot do that. <laughs> and, then, and now that stuff is gone. Nice. You the cannot do that is... anymore. Well, what, 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 but it, but it, it's quite, I think that's a really interesting point that you make because the, the whole focus has mm. been, and I know we're sort of digressing a little bit here to go back to stuff that we, yeah, we talked well, about no at the start right. of the season, but now we've seen it play out. The whole point of this was to so that the ball was in play more. Yeah. And the thing is, the ball can be out of play, but you're not wasting time yes. because you're setting up for yeah. a corner yeah. or a set yeah. play. And the ball can be in play and you are wasting time. Absolutely. So it's not necessarily yes. the best measure of whether or not a team is, is wasting time. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, but look, there is a thing that's happening. I've seen it in the women's game, seen it in the men's game as well, where the goalkeeper at certain times in the game all of a sudden, oh, the goalkeeper's gone down because you can't really take the goalkeeper <laughs> yeah. off and you stuff like that. You were talking about, yeah. the, uh, about Liverpool. The Merseyside derby mm. was one of the examples of that where, where Everton were, were winning, Liverpool came back into it. Yeah. But when Everton got their goal, Jordan Pickford yeah. would, would lean on the ball yeah. every time yeah. he got yeah. it. Yeah. And when Liverpool went ahead, <laughs> Alison Becker, as a as joke, as he was standing up and he went... Oh, yeah. 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 I do like that. Yeah. I do like what happens when oh, if okay. a team is wasting time and then it's added on, then you lose an extra time. That's you what happened. can't moan, you can't... And listen, I, I remember at the start of the season where everyone was up in arms about it, but the solution is very simple. Don't, don't waste, waste time. time. Yeah. Don't waste time. It's not even yeah. that difficult. Or be clever at doing it. <laughs> yeah. you just be clever. Yeah, just but, but, like Man City, just keep it for, yeah. uh, for yes. five minutes. Everybody's going to do it. Yeah. You know, like, like if you can go forward... Like imagine you're on the, on the, the opponent's half and you look around, you say, you got one minute to go, and you see a goalkeeper that far. You turn around, instead of you going forward, Go Play back. to your goalkeeper. Yeah. Mm. And there's still obviously a few things to be ironed out. As Paul Heckingbottom was saying, he felt that his goalkeeper was under pressure to, mm -hmm. to play the ball long yeah. because he wasn't allowed to to set up his his team in the way that he wanted to. I mean, it was always going to be be tough for them that game, Sheffield United. And I think we'll, we'll come back to this mm -hmm. theme at various stages throughout the season. But as I said, we're, we're going to look ahead quite early on because mm. normally we would we would reflect a bit more. But this North London derby that's coming up next week mm -hmm. is mouth yeah. because look you, you look at the teams they've played and yes both Arsenal and, Man and, and Tottenham have played Manchester United but we'll talk Manchester United later and they are not the force that, that they can be and mm -hmm. that historically they have been <coughs> and apart from that there's not really been anything in there that's been too tricky for them and so for both sides this is going to be their the first Olympic. real test yeah. of the season. And they both come into it with almost identical records. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it as well, because they're both the confidence in both teams are good and momentum. We may not see like the, the biggest names in those two sets of results, but what you're seeing is the, the results that they've got from those games and Tottenham and Arsenal having to get those results from those games. So now... What's going to happen with this derby, which is which is set up so beautifully, is that one of them, you know, depending on who wins, is going to get unbelievable confidence and yeah. momentum to go to the next the next level of what they're doing in the next five games. It's so beautifully balanced. You know, obviously, I think that with um, with Arsenal being at home, being a bit further down the line yeah. with the project, you know, what I mean, you you, you 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 may be thinking that okay, Arsenal may be favourites in that game, mm. but then you look at what Ange is doing with, with the Tottenham players and how quickly they've grasped what he wants and how organised, how intensified they are, how fit they look, how sharp they are, you think to yourself, well, this is just perfectly balanced. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful match-up right now. Yeah, but he also did it re pretty quick, huh? because, you know, he had a big surprise. Of course, we don't have to go into uh, selling your main striker and probably the striker of the league. But then y you got to adapt because sometimes, like, you don't realise how many goals he scored and how effective he was for the team. And then you need to get your 
own team to believe going because I'm sure when he was there, some of the guys were like, I don't need to do that. He's going to get me goals. Now they all have the confidence back. Some have to perform in a different level because they have to score the goals. And then for us to go that quickly and build a team and make them be the way, and we early stage, yeah, still. But when have we spoke about Spurs that yeah. early that we say like, guys, right this now. is like, this is a team to watch. And I, oh, look, I'm, I came from a rival team too, but I ain't lying to you, I'm watching them. Yeah, yeah. they're good. I like and and they're fun to watch. I think yeah. probably the last time we had sort of this positive a conversation about Spurs was under Mourinho. When, remember when they were, they were top of the league? Yes. Fairly early on and there was sort of talk that maybe they could they could be mm. pushing for it but like you said it wasn't this style of football it wasn't that kind of style that you were desperate mm. to, to go and watch no it wasn't um, but he's a really fearless kind of manager he likes his players to play on the front foot undefeated at home all season mm. as Celtic manager he's done the hard yards I think he's a really good fit for this Spurs side largely because um, a lot of people doubt him all the time. When he went to Celtic, who is this guy? A lot of people, even working in our industry in the UK, were very disparaging about him. Mm. When he was at Yokohama, Marinos, people were disparaging about him that back then as well. And he's always had to prove himself all the way through his career. So going there to North London, where people write off Spurs, people don't, ha mm. you know, don't they, 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 they don't take them seriously. Mm. So him going there, he straight away plugs into what the mentality is mm. their club. And, and with the Harry Kane thing, in particular, it's really striking because a lot of people felt that without Harry Kane, there'd be nowhere. Yeah, gone, yeah. But what they've done is, uh, uh, and I, I felt, I think I've said on the show before, they've needed to sell Harry Kane, rip that plaster off, mm -hmm. because too many players hide behind Harry Kane. Mm -hmm. And now that he's gone, other players are stepping up. I think City and Brighton are the only teams that have scored more goals now mm -hmm. than Spurs. So they, they, yeah, they do have yeah. that. Yeah, Seven different season. Spurs players have scored goals so far this season. Mm -hmm. And it's just the responsibility that the players are assuming. Son, Madison, Kulisevsky, mm. we just saw score yeah. a second ago. This moment right moment. here, mm. for me, I think is so, so telling about what the spirit that have engendered within mm. the squad. Because Son's leadership there in pushing mm. Richarlison to the fore, one goal since he'd arrived for £60 million 14 months ago. We saw him crying on the bench uh, in midweek when he was playing for his club and he was substituted against Bolivia. Yeah. But the confidence, you guys can speak better than me, to the confidence he'll get from scoring this <laughs> weekend. As a, as, a, as a striker, and, you know, obviously he's coming for the money he's come for, you know, with everything what he's said about his personal life and what's going on, the way he's been managed to get to this point and you could see the backing he's getting from the teammates. Because you know that if you can get Richarlison back to how, you know, we saw him when he was really flying at Everton, getting back to that with Son playing how he is, you know, Kulisevsky playing like he is. You see Brennan, John Brennan Johnson when he starts to emerge. Madison, you know, you've got Saar, you've got Basuma playing. Basuma playing as good as uh, saw him when he was at Brighton. Very uh, stable at the back. You're looking at a team now that very confident and a player up front, if he can now throw in 10, 12 goals, which he's easily capable of doing with Charleston now that his head's clear and everything, it, they, they're going to cause Did people Did you problems. have a period where you, where you went for a goal drought and then a, a goal went in for you and then suddenly you were flying? Yeah, you, well, the thing, when you do go through that kind of spell, like a five, six, seven game, it's, it's, you know, it's very... People hear it all the time, it's quite repetitive to say it, but, you know, you, you just have to keep doing the same things. But when you're looking at the players now with the amount of information that's coming to them all the time, the things that's happening in their personal lives, the thing they have to deal with, it's very hard yeah. to focus on yeah. just trying to score goals. And do. There's so much going on in his head. He seems to have stopped the noise in his head. Mm -hmm. The manager's given him time out of it and brought him in and eased him into it. And now, you know, we all know that he's had a little bit of problems in that. And now he feels more at ease. But as a striker, you do the same things and you just hope that... Once it goes in, you do feel like you're yeah. carrying on doing yeah. the normal things, but sometimes goalkeepers just make great saves. Mm. You maybe rush it because you're, you're, you're a bit worried, but then it's down to you to keep doing the same things what got you into the I remember when they covered Chelsea, right? And Shevchenko couldn't score goals. I remember it. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. And Crespo struggled as well. Difficult. You had so many strikers who yeah. struggled with Sutton, that number nine. Sutton. 
Chris Sutton, Chris Sutton, the Yeah, Kesman yeah. like, yeah. yeah, you know, was yeah. in He's Holland. Enjoying crazy. this, Nella. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we'll, we'll come back to Chelsea strikers <laughs> on firing later on in the no. program. That's one of the things we'll be <laughs> we'll be talking about. But it is, a, like you say, a historic problem. But for Richarlison, mm. this could be a big goal. One, one thing you've all picked up on is, is Son pushing him forward. Yeah. yeah. The, and and celebrations from other players within the squad. Ange Postecoglou has talked about, you know, that the, we don't know what happens in in people's lives off no. the pitch. Mm. And there seems to be a real will from the rest of the squad. They want Richarlison to succeed. Well, yeah. succeed. Not necessarily for the team, but for, for, for him. him. You, can, yeah. you can see that. You could see that, you know. And also, when you when you watch a song as, as a captain, right, there are two sides that I saw during that clip. If you can read it really quickly, you can see a guy that wants to lead his team, but also understand the human side of a player that... You can feel it in yourself sometimes. If something goes wrong with, with one of the players in the team, sometimes people forget it. They think like, oh, man. People always think about the money we make, but they forget the human side that is making the money because without being a human, you're not making anything. Mm -hmm. So I also, like, I'm not saying like it's bad or how, how we uh, achieve those, those levels. But one thing I want to make sure that people understand is we enjoy our job, but when it doesn't go well, it's just like anybody else. Yeah, if your job doesn't go well, you come home and you say you had a bad day. And this is the only thing we as footballers cannot say. Mm. It's almost like impossible to say, oh, I had a bad day on training. You know how many times we go to training, you come home and you're like, oh, man, today was really bad. But you don't want to talk to anybody can because you know it was bad. Can I tell you a quick story? Right? I, I interviewed a player at the start of the season one year. I won't say who he was or what club it was because it wouldn't be fair to him. Mm -hmm. But the player had struggled to score goals the season before. And he told me, he opened up about how difficult it had been mm -hmm. for him. And he said, I'd go home and I'd cry to my wife. <laughs> and when the interview finished, the club asked, them, will you not put that in? Right, yeah. Because it wouldn't be particularly helpful to him. Yeah. Um, and I didn't, for because uh, I agreed for mm. the very same reason we know how unforgiving football can be. Mm. But it was a really powerful insight into the impact that players' commitment to yeah, their yeah. job can have on them mm. when they can't do that job well. And I was in that press conference on Friday uh, with Ange Postikoglu, and a question was asked about mental health and whether we keep parroting all of the right things about mental health, but do we really understand mm. it? And Postecoglou said, yeah. exactly. He was saying that it isn't just something for footballers, it's for all of us. Yes. All of us exactly. here, all yes. of everyone watching all around the world right now, we all have things in our lives that are happening that we have to put to one side and go mm -hmm. in and do our jobs and put our best face on. But those things are there. And they can affect us. Uh, sometimes they can affect us too much. Yeah. And so for me, I was really happy when Charleston scored. Mm. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. And, and, and then in the footballing world, in the environment, like you say, to, to people outside of people are not going to have a lot of sympathy for a football. Well, that's yeah. what I was about yeah. to say. People They're don't have the sympathy because they see tough. you earn a lot of money. They, yeah, and, and, they, and for some reason, they think that the money um, helps you yeah. in respects of mental. It's, of course, you know, you're living a great life and it's a great life. It's a high prestige life you're living, but the, pre the pressures that come are like everybody, everyday people. Yeah. And it's, it comes even more on top because you have to then perform in a, on an arena where people are watching you. You're paid to entertain, you're paid to play, you're paid to play well, mm. and you're, you've got all these things going on. Yeah. And I think you guys have added things as well because social media now makes it even worse. Well, you make it even yeah. worse. But I, I have, like, uh, when I was at, uh, at Birmingham, um, we had a, a psychologist walking in and he sat down with every individual for 15 minutes. And I sat down with him for 15 minutes and it was kind of funny because I'm still very close to him today. And I spoke to him for 15 minutes and he said to me, stop the session. And I looked at him and I said, why? He said, you're already brainwashed. And I go, why? Uh -huh. I said, your mom did a great job in believing in yourself because his objective was to make us believe in ourselves. And then he was telling me how many guys had doubts in themselves. Mm -hmm in certain things, because that aspect comes in when we perform and we don't perform. That is the shake that a lot of footballers have, right? When things go well, we believe in ourselves. We say, oh, we are great. Mm. But when things go back, that's when we start, start downing ourselves. And I think uh, Mike is his name. And um, every time when I actually, when I come to London, I always talk to him or whatever. But he tells me now, because he still works with certain individuals in the game, 
And the stories that he tells me, and he cannot, he never calls anybody's name, but he always talks about the self-belief mm. because that is always the one that is big. That's and that's burning. also in a human's normal one. life. Yeah. Like the self-belief, mm. I think anybody that's w watching us now is doubting himself sometimes too. And he always says to me, he said, always make sure that your picture is clear in front of you, that you know what you want to achieve. Then it doesn't matter. If you're not yeah. get there today, the picture is still you there. Still you will get there. You can strive exactly. For it. You can still strive I think for one it. of the key things about the weekend, sorry, go, but one of the key things about this entire debate for me, because I, I work in sport, but I also work in the, the other sections of mm. my newspaper as well. Rochelle, what Charleston did last week goes beyond football. Mm. There are so many young men who don't speak mm. when they're feeling mm. vulnerable. And, you know, again, I, we joke a lot on here, but this is such a serious, powerful yeah. message that Richardson gave yeah. out. Mm. It's okay to say that yeah. you're not okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay to cry. It's okay, it's okay to admit that you need help. Mm. And I felt he... The goal that on Saturday for me, that wasn't the brave thing he did. The brave thing he did was saying to everyone, as a young man, mm. I, I and given the statistics around people who um, don't get through moments like this, it's important as a young man to say, I need help, mm. yeah. ask for help. Yeah. On the, the subject of, of self-belief that, that you were sort of alluding to there, Mario, one player who's, who's going to have to be drawing on his reserves of self-belief in the, in the coming weeks and, and months is Aaron Ramsdale because it looks as though Mikel Arteta is, is going to be switching between goalkeepers for the foreseeable future, certainly in terms of you know, playing David Raya in the game against Everton yesterday, and also because of what Arteta said about, you know, there are times when I do want to change a goalkeeper yeah. in the middle of the, the game because that would be the thing <coughs> to do, and, and why, shouldn't I, why shouldn't I do that? Look, in, in terms of the, the clean sheets that they've kept, Aaron Rensdale is, is ahead on that. Um, but in terms of um, things like save percentages, Raya's ahead. He's made fewer errors that have led to goals. That you know, there have been all kinds of comparisons made between these two, and obviously a lot's been made of, of Raya's distribution as well, which is, is something that that um, Mikel Arteta is going to be looking at. Just because something's the way it's always been done <laughs> doesn't mean it's necessarily the right way to go forward. Uh -huh. But can you? Do you think have two? Top choice goalkeeper. Now, before you, before you, Burnley had three at one stage, mm. didn't they? They had uh, Pope, oh. Heaton, yes, and I can't remember the other. Oh, yeah. I could remember. They had they had three they had three goalkeepers at one stage. Uh, Henderson was it? Yeah, Henderson, yeah. 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 Um, so there were there were three of them, and then I think that you know there was a time when uh, Sir Alex Ferguson mm. had. Um, Lindergaard, yes. Lindergaard with De Gea when yep. he when David De Gea was just settling um, in. Yep, yep. So it's been done temporarily. Mm -hmm. Well, so is it a long term plan? Is it well, something that we could see? What, well, what's going to happen is we're definitely going to see. There's going to be enough games this season for him to switch it around. I thought it was very interesting him saying that he felt upset about the fact that what, during the game he wanted to maybe change the goalkeeper, and he didn't do it, and he was upset that he didn't go through with it. Mm. I think that it's um, in Mikel. Arteta's mind, it's fair game to have a goalkeeper, two goalkeepers of, of, of number one stature. Mm. Um, because if you look at the Everton game, it's the margins. If, if Arsenal are going to try and catch City and do it, it's going to be the margins. And he believed, after watching last season's loss to Everton with set pieces, I need a goalkeeper whose main attribute, one of his main attributes, loves a long size, his, his distribution, is his coming of collecting the mm. ball, which he done unbelievably. And those are the margins. And what I like is that he's brave enough to say, I might do that. Yeah. Now, you say about Aaron Ramsey <clears throat> and how that's going to affect him. Aaron Ramsey as a number one at a club okay. of Arsenal. I, I keep saying that to him. <laughs> I, I keep saying that Aaron Ramsey. Yeah. Ramsey. Yeah. Aaron, Aaron, Ramsdale, Aaron, Ramsey. <laughs> Aaron Ramsdale as a number one at a club of Arsenal's stature should always be thinking this could happen. Yeah. Yeah. There's enough games for both of them. They're both going to push each other. Mm. And, and then now it comes down to your professionalism and what and how you react to it. This is what we're going to see, <laughs> how this plays out throughout, throughout the season. Because Mikel seems to me like he's, he's ready to go on this mm. yeah. and he's going to choose the goalkeeper he believes 
is best for that particular moment, like you do with a striker. Yeah, but he, you know what was good? What he, what, what I do like, I have to say, as a, as a defender, is the calmness that he brought to you. You know, like Herrera plays, and he brings calmness to the team. And, and that was particularly in that game of yesterday mm. that they needed. And we, we talked about it before. When you have a goalkeeper, you have one that is maybe good on the line and he stops the ball for you. But if you have one that comes out and catches the ball, and sometimes I could be marking someone, like let's say I'm marking you and you're maybe stronger or you're taller or whatever. No, you're marking Shearer, you're marking Shearer. Yeah, okay, even worse, I'm marking Shearer. Hey, you know, then I'm like, I'm, I'm holding yeah. him like... <laughs> oh, close, enjoy it! Yeah. 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 might give him more you, problems oh, you, you, down. I have marked him, believe me, and I know it wasn't easy. So then when the goalkeeper mm -hmm. comes up and then catches the it's ball for you, oh, you're so happy. <laughs> you sometimes, you look at your goalkeeper and go like, you fool, man. <laughs> but what's going to happen? I believe what's, what's going to happen with that is that we're going to see. <coughs> we're going to see how it goes because you're right. Yes, he has got a very calm nature. Very yeah. His distribution's brilliant. You saw yeah. it yesterday, a game that could have really gone against Arsenal mm -hmm. with the set pieces, and he kind of, like, really dealt with that very well. And I, I'm, I'm all for it simply because of the level that you have to try and get to, yeah. the margins. It's like, again, with the set pieces, Arsenal with the... What is the point of Arsenal continually putting corners into Everton, into Anana, mm. into Braithwaite, mm. you know, mm. into Tarkovsky, into all of those big players, yeah. Mikalenko. You put, so they took, what is it, seven or eight short corners yesterday, Arsenal? Eight did, of the 11 eight of short. The, passing the short. You see them all out of shape, bam. That's the margins. Arsenal didn't have too many shots. It didn't pepper the, the goal. You know, it was at one stage in the first half, it was 78% possession. Mm. It wasn't that kind of game. It was a game where this is going to be on one chance and the margins. This is why someone like Rea will be in goal for certain games. Mm. And this is why all of a sudden, OK, we'll take short corners because we're going to have to move them about yeah. to get it in because that's the way we may score. I like it. I like the fact that he's thinking so out of the box in what he's trying to do at the moment yeah. to, to bridge the gap. I know, but... Aaron Ramsdale. I know. I just think Aaron will be he, went, fine. he went in, he knew that the Arsenal fans didn't really want him. Nobody thought he was going to be good enough to, to take over and he felt mm. unloved. And then the Arsenal fans fell in love with no, him. They, and, and they and will now, love him forever. And now David Ray has been brought in and I just, on a, went, on a he, human he, level. On a human well, level. Well, because, that, he, because he came on and spoke to us on the show. That's <laughs> and he's such a wonderful guy. But this is the, the world the he's in, yeah. the world Aaron Ram, Ramsdale's in, <laughs> is elite yeah. at yeah. the top end. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's something that he'll be able to deal with because he will be in there doing fine. And, of course, they're going to have so many games as well this exactly. season, Arsenal, so there'll be plenty of opportunities for Mikel Arteta to play both his goalkeepers yeah. and even within the same match, should he choose to. <laughs> home certainly isn't where the heart is then uh, for Everton. They've lost all three home league games this season, as it happens, all by a 1-0 scoreline. And even more damaging than that, the last time Everton scored more than once at home in the league was October 2022, almost a year ago. What are you going to say when we were playing? <laughs> <laughs> so By the way, they're going, it might carry on that long. <laughs> but that was under Frank Lampard. So Sean Dyche hasn't even scored more than one goal at home in the league as the Everton boss, which is quite incredible. 26% possession against Arsenal. One corner, one shot on target. What did you make of their approach today? Um, relatively negative. But obviously, you're coming up against Arsenal, who are very neat and tidy in possession. But they move the ball really well, Jermaine, but they do, and that's the that's the frustrating thing for me. You look at the the players that Everton brought on today, and I was quite surprised to see Beto going off and uh, to be replaced by Dominic Calvert Lewin. Look, if you're up against it, put the ball, put the the two big lads up up top, and go long. Play direct. Make it really uncomfortable. You're not going to outpass Arsenal on the ball. You're not going to outmaneuver them. You're not going to outsmart them. But just, just take it back to the old school. Do what, what we used to see in the olden days where the ball goes direct, everybody squeezes up. The two centre-halves for Arsenal would not have enjoyed playing up front against, uh, playing Beto, at the back yeah. against Beto and Dominic Calvert-Lewin. So that's what they needed to do a little bit more. Yeah. Take it back to, similar to what Sean Dyche used to do while he's at Burnley with Chris Wood and, and uh, Ashley Barnes. Make it an uncomfortable game. But it was frustrating to, to, to see him to, take those guys and use, take them off. To use an old school phrase, if you're going to try and bully Arsenal, at least do it right. Yeah. Don't mm. be half-hearted in your approach. So if you're going to have 26% possession mm. and you're going to bypass the midfield and go long, do it properly and go long with purpose. And then you, what happens is you go long and direct. Then your, your back four can get on the halfway line. Your midfield three can squeeze. You can get nice man-for-man. Man. You can get what we call the knockdown and the bits, the 50-50s, and you can create pressure... You can create momentum. Mm. Fans get on board with it. They like yep. a tackle. Something's happening in the final third. You manoeuvre some free kicks. You manoeuvre some shots and some corners. And you can see where you're going. I thought 
that performance today, it was worrying because of where Everton are. Obviously, five games in, one point. Yeah. But I no wonder, identity. I do wonder, because we've talked about Guardiola over the years. We've talked about Postecoglou this season. We've talked about De Gerbi. I just start to wonder now what someone like a Graham Potter with that group of players could do, because I think they're underperforming. Also, the thing is, this sense of apathy around Goodison Park, that's the first game under new owners. Not that you would have known it. But no, There's no sense of excitement. But There's no lost... sense of what's round the corner. But they lost. Who did they lose against? Fulham? Was it yeah. Wolves? Yeah. First two games? Yeah. You know, you, you've got to pick up some serious points now because you're five games in, you're relegation battle. The, the, the games that are coming up off the top of my head, they've got Brentford away. That's not going to be easy. Mm. There's every chance that Brentford might win that game. Then mm-hmm. I think they've got two home games on the, sk- on the spin. They've got Bournemouth and Luton. Yeah. You have to take six points from those two games. It's I mean, a must. You boys won't need reminding. They only survived on the final day of last season. But five games into this season, how worried are you for Everton? Um, Very. Look, there's no real identity in the way that Everton are playing. Like we said before, if you go direct, go back to front and then squeeze the pitch up, uh, squeeze up the pitch, that's an identity. That's a certain way of playing. At the moment, there's, you don't really know what, their, what the game plan is. No. You know, get the ball out wide to Dan Juma. Get it out wide to um, McNeil. Dwight McNeil. Put the ball in the box nice and early. They're not doing that either. No, but there's no shame to losing to Arsenal because they are becoming quite a heavyweight force in the Premier League under Mikel Arteta. And as it happened, uh, Leander Trossard came off the bench, of course, for the injured Gabriel Martinelli to score the all-important goal. Is this it's good, sort of like a, a training ground routine in some well respects? Well rehearsed. Yeah. yeah it's very could, well rehearsed. It's patient. You can see the movement of all the players. They all know where they're going to be. They all know what they're going to do. Saka pulled that little cutback to, to Trossard and he didn't even look, which means, look, they worked on it. Look at Trossard's movement there, just on the edge of the 18-yard box. Never standing still, always on the move. Saka, always on the move. That's a manager. That's a manager in our Drilling tether. them in. Yeah, thinking outside the box, thinking, right, if we get wide free kicks and we get corners, are we going to get any joy by putting it direct into no the box? Chance. No chance. Mm. So you've got to try and come up with little game plans, mm. wide free kicks, short corners, etc., to try and manoeuvre the centre-backs into uncomfortable positions. It's a great training ground goal. Patience was the key for Arsenal because earlier in the game, they thought they had scored through Gabriel Martinelli, but it was disallowed. Let's speak to former Premier League referee Chris Foy, who's a regular on the show. Chris, always good to speak to you. So explain to us, why was this chalked off? Yeah, it was chalked off because when Gabriel passed the ball uh, to Nketiah, he was in an offside position and, of course, they, Arsenal retained possession. They passed the ball round and, and Martinelli scored a goal. I think the fly in the ointment that confused a few people was when that uh, Gabriel passed the ball forward. It actually deflected off Beto. It wasn't a deliberate play and people were thinking, because he's touched the ball, that makes him onside, which isn't the case. And the law's quite specific now when it talks about deliberate play deflection. There's the deflection. Um, he comes back from an offside position in Ketia. They retain possession in the attacking phase of play and the goal is quite rightly disallowed. Uh, an, an excellent piece of VAR in that situation, Manish. Yeah, and this is where we've got to make it clear. It's all about whether that touch was intentional or not. Yeah, is it a deliberate play or yeah. is it a deflection? It's talking about, you know, coordinating your body movement, the, the distance the ball travelled was very short, time, limited time to react. So it's the right call. Yeah, great use of VAR, that, isn't it? That's what we want. You wouldn't right? spot that in real time. No, definitely. Fact, you didn't spot it. No, I, I don't think. I think very few people saw that. What's intriguing is the initial pass. I think it was Gabriel was looking to pass it out to the right. It was Ben yeah. White. So the pass initially was going out to the right. Uh, Beto's touch took it directly through the middle of the pitch. So I, I was intrigued to know if that would have played any part of it. The direction of the pass. Chris? No, it, it, it's no. not, Jermaine. It, it, it all talks about deliberate play or deflection, no. and that yeah. quite clearly was a deflection. All right. Okay. Chris, thanks very much indeed. Um, Arsenal fans will be delighted to see the back of Everton or ending their hoodoo. <laughs> you know, we could limit Spurs to efforts from outside the box, which Wes dealt with and dealt with well, and we dealt with balls into our box. So, yeah, I think sometimes you've got to accept that you've got to give something away, and we defended our box very well. Uh, yeah, and uh, went in front, missed a couple of really good chances ourselves. Uh, yeah, so to lose a game in that way is obviously really cruel, but it doesn't it doesn't change our performance. Fair to say, a uh, fair bit going on during the whole game, and um, we had to deal with a lot today. Um, and you know, I, I really liked the way we dealt with it. You know, we uh, we showed again real resilience. Uh, you know, we dominated the game, just couldn't get that goal. You know, we sort of opened them up and then, you know, you kind of 
try and keep things as tight as possible, but <clears throat> they're always a threat, you know, long throws, balls in the box and they score, and then, you, again, like I said, you're looking for a reaction, and uh, brilliant for the guys, brilliant for our supporters. Um, you know, it's part of our sort of evolution as a team. What an unbelievable game then uh, in North London and a bit of history made in the process. The latest ever recorded winning goal since records began was scored by Spurs and Kulusevski there. 99 minutes and 53 seconds. And also, as it happens, the latest ever comeback because, of course, Richarlison's goal moments earlier was registered at 98 minutes. I mean... Don't be time-wasting anymore. That is, I mean, but <laughs> that's the thing now, right? Costly. Is this going to be now more of a regular thing? Because we're playing so much injury time at the end of the first and second half. Well, the reason that we're seeing lots more injury time is because they're trying to stop all the fake injuries and the time-wasting and all that anyway. But what's happening is they're adding it on to the end of the game. So, yeah. in short, stop wasting time. Yeah. yeah. Hey, costly. Listen, it came across yeah. Sheffield United. But listen, 13 points from 15 games. Incredible. For Ange Postacoglu, who always find somehow a way to get something out of a game. Yeah, well, he's built a very good squad, hasn't he? You know, the three subs that come on, I think Brennan Johnson came on, Perisic came on, mm. Richarlison came on, so he's got a very good squad to work with. But I like his style, I like his attitude, and I think the players will appreciate that. Listen, there'll be a time, if we fast forward a couple of months' time, Tottenham might lose two on the spin. Mm. They're not finished yet, but they're going in the right direction, they're trending the right way because of the football that they're playing. And all footballers will tell you, you can get on board with a manager that wants to play football mm. because you're going to be on the front foot. You're going to try things. You can express yourself. Look at someone like Basuma, for example. You know, kind of think Antonio Conte really fancied him. Many others, I think, under Jose, maybe he's one or two under Antonio Conte. They were probably playing on the back foot, a little bit negative, trying to play counter-attack in football. Didn't really have the ball a lot. Find themselves one or two down within 45 minutes. They had to constantly try and come back in second halves. This Tottenham team now looks like they're playing good football. And I think any fan will get on board with your team winning games, playing yeah. this way, but they'll also stay on board while you're still playing this football when you're drawing and losing the odd one. And what a story for Richarlison, who looked like he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, Jermaine, only last week, in tears mm. uh, in a Brazil shirt because, you know, he missed a couple of really good chances, if I'm not mistaken, against Bolivia. And it's been a tough few months, really, for with club and country. But then to come up with a goal and then an assist was, was a scriptwriter's dream. It absolutely was. And I think a lot of that has to go down to Ange Postacoglu as well. I think what he does in terms of his man management for the players, not only Richarlison, but Basuma and a lot of the other fringe players, he's given them that extra uh, confidence that, that they've been lacking for ages. Something that maybe they were a little bit worried or nervous about being judged by the last managers or didn't want to upset them. Now they seem to be playing with so much freedom and confidence that... You're seeing the best of Spurs. What did you say it was? 13 points from 15. Yeah. That is incredible. Who would have thought that last season Spurs would be picking up that many points in that many games? Not me. I, I know that for a fact. Yeah. They've got um, Richarlison in there now. Came off the bench. Was fantastic when he came on, by the way. Brennan Johnson, great energy. Lovely little touch. Madison's been around great. The Madison has been a, a revelation there also. Mm. Um, but all of these guys have got a major point to prove to themselves, but also to the, to the club that have invested all this money and, and uh, trust in them. You have to be prepared, I think, as a manager and a coach. You have to be prepared to give your individuals freedom. I think some coaches, probably like Antonio Conte, probably like Jose Mourinho, not I just like those this. two, this is a great gesture. I like this. This is a great gesture because, yeah. you know... Take, take the adulation. Go on, take yeah. it. And, and yeah, you deserve, you deserve it. it. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, we, we all like to see players do well, but we like to see players on a comeback when it's a when it's quite emotional and sometimes it's quite personal. So mm. give him all the credit that he deserves for coming out and issuing that little statement where he said he wants to see a sports psychologist. But my point is under, under Postecoglou, I think you have to be prepared to give your players freedom because as a manager, if you're Antonio Conte or Jose, not just those two, but those two come to mind because they were previous Tottenham managers, if you constantly put the handbrake on and say, Jermaine, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, all of a sudden, when you get it, you're going to think, safe. What am I, I wanna, supposed to do well, now? I'll, I'll play safe. You're yeah. thinking about it imagine, rather than just but doing it. I want to try a trick. Yeah. Mm. I want to try a Cruyff turn. I want to try this. I want to try that. Express yourselves. That's what he's got on a group of players, but that comes from the manager. He's mm. turning them into a very different beast, is Ange Postecoglou, and yeah. trying to get rid of that narr narrative that we know about Spurs and crumbling under pressure. Arsenal and Liverpool next. Is this yeah. the real kind of, I suppose, I suppose the way that we're going to measure the, the improvement that they've made? 
Well, listen, this is the best time for them to play those teams. They're going into it full of confidence. They've got a, a whole load of points on the board. So even if they do lose or get a, a point out of them, it's not the end of the I world. I wouldn't judge him on it. No, I wouldn't judge him on it at all. I wouldn't judge him on those two games. But it gives, it's an early indicator. I would, I would judge him on what happens after these two games. Mm. OK. North London. I'm Derek Ray, joined here on the commentary box, as always, by Lee Dixon. And looking forward to bringing you action from the Premier League coming right up. It is Tottenham Hotspur, and they take on Sheffield United. Well, I'm excited about this one. Great atmosphere in here. Everybody looking forward to this game, especially me and you. Ali Ali, given away by Tottenham. David McGoldrick. Stevens, Oliver Norwood, spot on with that tackle. And we're looking at a player who seems to be at the peak of his powers now, Hyung Min So. Oh, in with a chance! The net is steering him in the face. In it goes! An early opening statement in this match. And look at the celebrations. Well, as we see from the replay, it's a classic pullback cross that sets up the chance, and it all leads to a 2v1 on the keeper, which he really doesn't have any chance with. It's a great team goal. 1 0 then. Goal for Tottenham Hotspur, number nine, Gareth Bale. Kane. Great vision from Harry Kane. Dele Alli, and another one, two quick goals, will it turn out to be the two-punch knockout? Well, here's the replay, he didn't panic, did he? Decent strike, good technique, bread and butter strike, really, but it's in the back of the net. Slightly different vantage point in terms of the goal that was scored. So, 2-0 now. Tottenham Hotspur goal! Number 20, Delhi Ali. And Kane comes into the move. Good looking attack, this. And he's broken free. Another goal! And surely there's no way they can throw this away. Dominant. Well, here's the replay. Great disguise on the pullback cross, and that eventually leads to what amounts to a simple task of rounding the goalkeeper. 2v1. There's only one winner.